welcome back to Interjections, Juventus Derby Recap Edition. I'm your host, Andrew. I've got Jay and Irfan with me. Miko is actually at the game, so he's traveling, and as a result, he won't be here to rationalize this disgraceful result. Jay, how are you doing? I'm exhausted. Uh, I know that you guys, due to the time zone differences, it's it's quite early in the morning for you guys. It's 10 p.m. here in here in Sydney, Australia. But I decided to to match your freak and take a nap. So I've only just woken up as well. So sleepy, belligerent, and extremely confused to put it nicely about the results. So let us do what must be done. Irfan, you had a worse day than most Inter fans yesterday. How are you holding up? Yeah, I was just going to say it's still kind of debating what's worse. Uh, giving up a two-goal lead to your arch rivals at home or losing a football game on a last-second Hail Mary um, where your team was just disgraceful. So I guess in one sense, disappointed in defense kind of sums up the day. But uh, there's a lot more to it, so whatever. Let's just let's just get to it. This was one of those games that you look back on, like we're gonna remember this one for the rest of our lives, and unfortunately, not for many good reasons. There, there are just those iconic derbies, you know, you're never going to forget the four nil over Juve in the treble season, the Cardi for Santon Spalletti substitution. And now you can throw this one into the pile as not, not forgetting this one anytime soon. I honestly don't know where to start because there was just such so much happened in this game. It's like, where do you even begin? There were periods where we looked like the better team. There were periods where Juve looked like the better team. And I do think on the whole, we were better for longer at different portions of the match. But we completely fell apart down the stretch. And as a result, we do not have anything good to talk about. It's unacceptable to blow two separate leads in this fixture. Everyone's going to be, everyone is, including us, going to talk about the blowing the two goal lead in the second half. And it's the real dark mark on the game. But it's just as bad to concede. So soon after Zelensky's first penalty, you've got DeVry once again in a big game, failing us by completely missing man-marking McKenney. The second goal Juve scored to go up 2-1 was just completely inept team defending, starting with Mkhitaryan losing the ball. And then, I don't even know what this guy's name is, Canseo picking apart our left side really all game long, DeMarco struggling defensively. But... Even after, like I said, there were ebbs and flows in those games because even after we go down 2-1, we rally. We score three goals in a row, two before the half, and it should have been enough to kill the game. When, when you score, and this will obviously be a theme through this podcast, if you score four goals in this fixture, it should be more than enough to win. We talked about before the match, I think we did a great job recapping it or capping it rather, just previewing it, where you look at this Juve team and they're not the same with Bremer gone. There were some weaknesses at center back we we were able to expose. And this wasn't a high-scoring Juventus team. And somehow we let them pump out their best offensive performance of the season. And really, it's hard to pick out anyone on this team who defended well yesterday. It was just a complete and total collapse. It should have been enough to kill the game. Like I said, scoring four goals, and we had more than enough chances to score fifth. And we're also going to talk about Lotaro and his failings and how he let us down. But really, my biggest beef with this match falls to Inzaghi, who was more interested in scoring a fifth goal and seeing out the results. When we went up two goals, he did his yellow card substitution, he took Pavar off, he puts on a defensively shaky Bissek. And we never looked the same. I'm not blaming Basek. I'm just saying we, we kept attacking. We kept throwing bodies forward. And Juve just had chance after chance after chance in the counter. 
we attacked with a relentless abandon and we hung ourselves out to dry. And as soon as Juve got their third, every Inter fan I know o- online it was saying, yep, they're getting a fourth and possibly a fifth. And it didn't it didn't take long. Yildiz completely dominated us. He had two really nice goals, but two goals where we just our right side didn't put up any anything for him to overcome. It was just too easy for him. So, you know, if you would have said before this game, you're going to draw Juventus, it'd be a reluctant acceptance. I think we were, as we went around and did predictions last week, pretty much everyone thought this was going to be a, a draw or a loss with all the injuries we have. We would have taken the point. But to be up two goals so late in this match and to completely blow it, it's, it's just unacceptable. And now you have to ask yourself a lot of questions about what is going on with the defending on this team. Why do we keep getting overrun? Why do we keep conceding goals? And why is our captain unable to finish the simplest of chances? Jay, I'll start with you. There's a lot to unpack. You know, I, I'm, I want to focus a bit on, I guess, the availability of both teams. And I don't. I, I mean, this sounds like I'm just condemning us more than you know even more than we deserve but Juve were missing Bremer, Coop Miners, Gonzalez and Douglas Louise you know they played so many youngsters this feels like the time we kind of lost at home to Barcelona on the 15 in the Champions League you know what I mean it, it's it's pretty humiliating our only absence was Hakan and although he's a notable lab well and a Chirby, I guess uh, and as notable an absence as Hakan is, like pound for pound, they were far more disadvantaged by injuries than we were. And when you look at the subs, look at the kind of guys they brought on. They brought on uh, that Mbangola guy. They brought on Savona, I think. They brought on Yildiz, of course. The average age of the guys they brought on was 21 years of age. Meanwhile, our uh, starting 11, the average age was 29. And I think what you saw was just the the enthusiasm, the tenacity of youth simply blowing away this old and increasingly obsolete looking team. And why are we, um, why are we having so much trouble holding on to leads, securing results? It just seems like the the bite the tenacity that we had that mental resolve to to hold on to to results and to and to secure a victory has completely evaporated and i don't think that's entirely age related of course but i think age does play a factor and it just uh highlights the glaring deficiencies we have in our squad and i'm sorry but i i really do not want to hear any of this oh we don't have money we can't afford it kind of thing but Why do we not have a single player of any kind of artistry or flair or excitement to bring off the bench? The closest we have is literally motherfucking Joaquin Correa. A 30-year-old failure of a player is the closest thing we have (laughs) to compare to like Yildiz, uh, who Juve brought on, obviously. And that is just unfathomable. It's completely unforgivable. Any top team worth a shit has some kind of young fast exciting technically skilled attacking player most teams have fucking dozens of them we are we are the only team in europe who has i think we are the lowest team in europe in terms of dribbles we are one of the obviously one of the older teams in europe as well and when we are so system based it just um I think you're kind of doing yourself a disservice when you are so based upon your system because it relies on your system to work over time. It relies on your system to just work consistently without fail in order for you to carve out opportunities. And when it doesn't work, then you just, you shit out of luck. And when you have these young players like Yildiz or, you know, like even fucking Chukwese or whatever, right? Or even Noslin from Lazio, who was immense in their victory over Genoa. You, you can sometimes rely on their unpredictability, their youthful exuberance and aggression and their desire to take on a man and beat them 
and go on the dribble and that kind of thing to to create opportunities and these can be game winning moments but we just don't have the ability to rely on that because there's a complete absence of that in our squad now is that the reason why we didn't win the game no of course not that's just something that's been on my mind for a long time for years and you know something that felt like um felt like salt being rubbed in the wounds when we saw yielders do do exactly that but as to your point there's just so many things that happened in this game that we can talk about and that was one of them for me a big one for me but another thing i want to talk about is um the goalkeeping situation when we were 4-2 up and we were really pressing for that fifth goal and it looked like we might get it di gregorio kept his team in the game there was that free kick from outside the box from DiMarco. There was that uh, deflected volley by Barella. And I think there was one or two more, but he made some big saves to keep his team in the game. And ultimately that, I don't know, investment, if you will, was repaid by his team taking advantage of still being in the game to, to fight back and, and to, to salvage a draw. Meanwhile, we could not rely on our seasoned veteran keeper to do anything this game i don't think i don't recall someone making a single save of note in fact three of the goals were or two of the goals were quite close to him in terms of placement yet he couldn't stop either i am of the opinion that he could have done better on yield his first goal as well and then it just uh or it makes you ask what the fuck are we doing here is this not just another handanovich versus onana situation with like a worse version of Anana on the bench. Like, why do we spend 15 million for a fucking backup goalkeeper, which directly hurt us in other areas because of our wild decision to allocate our budget there? If we're not even going to play Martinez, Joseph Martinez, and if he's not even good enough to replace this version of Summer who can't stop shit and who hasn't been reliable since, as I've said multiple times, midway through last season. Let me just touch upon Lautaro. There's a stat flying around, which is hilarious as it, which is as hilarious as it is um, just really humiliating, to be honest. But the guy has not scored at San Siro in eight months. And I don't know how much longer people can, can defend him. I think, I think there's just such a predictable element to the way he plays sometimes. You know, at the end of the day, I actually think he's an extremely conventional number nine. I don't think he really brings anything I don't think it brings anything outside of the box to the game I think he really is uh, it sounds kind of wild to say it but kind of a boring player I really do he doesn't have much technical skill as we've discussed many times he can't beat a man on the dribble in fact he's probably one of the worst strikers I've ever seen when it comes to trying to beat a man and dribble he's got a good first touch sometimes where he can kind of beat a player with a unpredictable first touch or like a back heel or whatever that is but beyond that if you know you know if Lataro is standing man on man against the striker he's not going to take him on beat him and then put the ball into the net his finishing is absurdly inconsistent uh, and then his form is exactly the same where he'll go on long long stretches where he'll score no goals or extremely few goals and again this is our leader our captain and our most expensive player and again I'm not trying to open up a big can of worms discussion as to let, let's sell him or anything like that but it, it needs to be it needs to be talked about the final thing i'll say and this season as a whole just seems to be a throwback to the second season under inzaghi where all the you know the bad things that we disliked about inzaghi the kind of cowardice the fear the the inflexibility the the inability to trust some players sometimes when it comes to players with bookings um that kind of that kind of thing has really reared its head this season there's no option but for the squad to just you got you gotta you gotta wake up a bit i feel like there's this conceit around the team where i don't know the players seem like their bellies are full after one scudetto and it's just not good enough yeah great points jay and with regards to Lataro, I really thought he took a step forward last season. It was going to be a permanent one. And in hindsight, it feels like the only difference was his conversion rate happened to be higher than it typically is. Because otherwise, like his style of play, it's the same. 
I don't feel like he's any less involved than he normally is. It, he's getting chances and he's just not converting them. And maybe last year was a fluke. Maybe last year was just the world, per, the stars perfectly aligning for him. But I'm, I'm out of explanations. If he really is just ruined because he didn't have a preseason, then we need to park the guy on the bench for a month and let him get his feet under him because he is costing us games. He is costing us chances. Obviously, he had the goal last week to bail us out, and it was phenomenal. But on the whole, he's he's not helping matters. He's making things worse. And part of the problem for all of this stems back to what you said, which is we don't have squad depth. A Cherby missed yesterday's game, and we were clueless in defense. DeVry was horrible. Bastoni was not good, and Pavar was the only good defender, and we had to sub him off. I put had in air quotes because he picked up a, he picked up a booking. We already know the story in the midfield where we had no bodies. We already know the story in attack where there, there's nothing off the bench besides Arnautovic's five-year-old mentality and Korea, and it's just... We don't have game changers. We don't have game wreckers. And when you need to settle things down, you need to control a game. We don't have anyone we can bring on to accomplish that. And there's a reason why we've conceded so many more goals than the other top teams in the league. It's like we're like more than double the amount of goals conceded than Napoli, more than double the amount of goals conceded than Juve. Because this is what we do now. We turn games into track meets because we just we can't defend as a team anymore. Late goals too. Always late goals. Yeah, last year we just, everything about us felt inevitable. You knew we were going to win. You knew we were going to shut a game down. It Would we go 30 matches without conceding a goal in the last 15 minutes last year? Now we do it on the regular. We did it against Milan. We did it against Juve. We do this against every team we play. We concede late goals and we gift away leads. We cannot hang on to leads this year. And... Wait, I'll I'll give Miko a shout out since he's not here to, you know, peg us back. Maybe the rational person says, "Hey, despite all these shortcomings, you're only four points back of the Scudetto." But it, and that's not enough. Like this should be the window where we're taking advantage of these teams who are taking in new managers, who are breaking in new players, and instead we've completely squandered it and. It's only going to get harder from here because the reinforcements aren't coming. We aren't signing new players. We aren't going out and integrating injured players back into the squad aside from a con. Like, this is it. These are the guys we're stuck with. These are the guys we're dealing with, and they need to figure it out. Irfan, you've been quiet. What's on your mind? Yeah, I mean, all the points you guys are making are great. I mean, the kind of you went through the list I had of points I wanted to make. I think, you know, I share Jay's frustration on not having anything on the bench. That's remotely a game changer. You know, somebody who can come on and give us a spark, somebody who can come on and either create something or score goals. Any, any player that has like the ability to, to do some sort of individual brilliance is just not on our team. Um, And I think that that is extremely frustrating because when you're in a game and you need a goal, like if we're in a game, we talk about situations where we keep conceding late and that's fair. We'll get to that in a second. But if you're desperately in need of a goal and you know, your season relies on either getting that last second draw or getting a win, there's nothing on that bench that's even remotely awe inspiring that you would bring on and be like, all right, here we go. You know, let's see Taremi do a, you know, individual moment of brilliance, or let's see, you know, Arnautovic create something out of nothing, like, and, and the midfield, my God, like, good good luck finding anything in the midfield that can give any sort of attacking spark. It's just not there. And so that's, that's extremely frustrating. Conceding goals and conceding late goals is just unbelievably pathetic, in my opinion. And, you know, I... It, if we didn't have players that actually had talent, I would just chalk it up as something that's a personnel issue. Um, and I agree that we don't have any sort of player that we can bring on like in the midfield or in defense and just say, all right, the door is closed now. Like Everything is shut down. There's no chance we're conceding. Um, 
you know, like the way Mourinho essentially used to do back in the day, right? Like if you, if you had like a one nil lead, um, when Marino did his substitutions in like the 60th, 65th, 70th minute, you knew it was game over. You knew there was like nothing that we were going to give up. And there's nobody like that. I do think some questions have to be asked about Inzaghi's in-game management, his in-game substitutions. Like we can talk about the personnel, and I think that's a fair point. But there's also an issue with the way he manages the game and the way he does not seem to be able to play any sort of robust system to maintain leads. And the substitutions that he keeps inevitably making um, and I just, I, I don't really get it because this whole like fear that he has about someone with a yellow card, I get it. Uh, but like, you have to, at some point, trust your players to be able to perform, especially if they're performing well in the match. And it's not hard to just have a conversation with them to remind them from the sidelines or remind them at the half that like, Hey, you already have a yellow card. I'm really going to ride you here to make sure, because I don't have anybody else that I trust. And I, the fact that with veteran players, we can't do that. We're not talking about some 17, 18 year old hotheads. We're talking about extremely experienced players. And so the fact that he doesn't seem to be able to do that frustrates me. There's so many chances, so many matches where I hear complaints from fans about the way his substitutions are occurring. And most of the times I agree. I think he, he needs to be a little bit more just disciplined when it comes to his players and the players seem to be more disciplined and he's got to do a better job of, of figuring out how to manage the squad down the stretch in games. Like I just don't understand his game management. And also sometimes you have to be a little bit more adventurous in your tactics too. Like this is the second time now this, this, this match to me reminded me a lot of the match last year that we played against Bologna where Mata basically Took we, we we had a late goal from Augusto and we thought we were going to win in the Copa, and then he brings on like I think Xerxes or somebody else, and their substitutions again young, hungry, you know uh, tricky players they scored two goals on us to sucker punch us out of the cup, um, a cup that we know Inzaghi cares a lot about so it's not like we were just willing to let it go, and so he seems to have our number. At least he seems to have us figured out in that once we're tired or once this team we're full of aging kind of, you know, talented players, once we're a little bit uh, tired, he, he brings on some young people with pace. Um, and, you know, I, again, I rate Yildiz. I obviously rate Xerxes, but I don't see how either of them are such world beaters that we can't contain them. Um, if, if they would have been on, on the front end of this match, most likely we would have been able to contain them. So I just, I don't understand what he's doing in game. Um, it's pretty inexcusable, especially like if it keeps happening. If it happened once or twice, fine. If it's a fluke goal, fine. Yesterday, the thing that frustrates me the most is, yes, there were individual lapses on defense, but it felt like a massive systemic issue. And the results now have kind of revealed that it is a massive systemic issue. And that's the biggest problem. It's not one moment of you know la lack of concentration or something like that it's just a constant barrage of shitty 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 defense and this is his time like as a manager as a good manager as a well-rated manager on the world scene figure your shit out why does this keep happening over and over again you know you can't blame the players at some point you also have to blame the manager and the tactics you got to figure out what the hell you're doing where you can't keep a goddamn lead it's unbelievable and so i don't know Again, like you said, if we would have said we're going to draw Juventus, none of us would have been super upset. But the manner in which we did it and the manner in which we keep continuing to do it this season is incredibly frustrating. And again, it's fair to talk about the attack. It's fair to talk about Lotaro. I have my complaints with him. But the fact that you know we couldn't keep a lead is unbelievable. And the fact that it seems to be happening consistently and in the same manner, right? Like even the first couple of goals that Juventus scored, it was really their wing play with the Cohen Sauer or whatever that just completely wrecked us. It's like we're incapable of staying in front of some of these guys and preventing the ball in, the dangerous ball into the box. Like it's it's just criminal. Like it's it's they're not tight enough on these guys. I don't know. It's it's very frustrating right now, the state of the team. 
And it's not just the result, one point. It's the manner in which we got it that's really frustrating. And I think there are some real questions about Inzaghi's in-game management. I don't think we can like avoid that conversation anymore because this is this is also on the manager. It's not just the players that are available. Yeah, and much like how I thought last season was us graduating Lataro to a next level, to an upper echelon that he was going to reestablish himself as, like just being a tier above who he was previously. I viewed Nzagi the same way where I I really did not like Nzagi's first season at the club. I hated his substitution patterns of automatically taking off guys with bookings. There was a lot that frustrated me. But last year, I really didn't have any criticisms of Nzagi because I thought he had moved on from a lot of his poor tendencies, his really odd substitution patterns, and it Obviously, we ran away with Scudetto. There was very little to complain about. But this season just feels like a step back where, if you look at yesterday, he took off his best-performing center back for a player who is poor defensively, and it just completely eroded our back line. And even just, like, ignore the individual players for a second. The, The tactical decision to just surrender the midfield in pursuit of a fifth goal was foolish we were so disjointed we had we had like like jay said it, we had great chances and Di gregorio bailed out juve but juve were just taking the ball picking it up around their box or around the midfield and just running at us and we we could not get the guy who picked up the ball and, and dribbled with it to pass it because he would just take us on and beat us every time and it was just relentless how often they were creating excellent, dangerous chances on the counter. And Irfan, to your point, I think part of it boils down to we don't have athletically gifted players in defense like DeMarco. Everyone tries to sell him as a world-class defender, but he's not. He is a fantastic attacking player who isn't particularly fast and isn't a particularly good defender. And Yesterday, when he went up against a really, really good right-wing player, he, he showed himself. And I was disappointed with Dumfries. Like, I view Dumfries as a decent defensive player, and he he was made a fool several times yesterday. Terrible performance by him defensively. and But really, like I was saying, this is on Inzaghi for me. He should have lowered the block. He should have made the team play more disciplined, more compressed. We should have tried to catch them on the counter, dared them to score two goals, rather than just giving them these acres of space. Because this is just something you see time and time again with this team is, like Irfan said, we cannot stop these players who are excellent technical players. We cannot stop these excellent dribblers. It just feels like they're always scoring, I don't want to say world class, but these galazzos against us because we cannot get in front of them. We cannot close them down. Because we're not athletic enough. We are an unathletic team. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way because we know what the system is. It's a lot of short passes. It's a lot of systematic. It's a lot of formula-based stuff. But like Jay said, we don't dribble by players. We don't have world-class athletes. And when you turn these games into track meets, like the end of the Milan Derby turned into or this game turned into, we're just never going to pull away and win one of those games. We don't have the talent for it. What did you guys think of the penalties yesterday? Obviously, letting Zelensky take them turned out to be the right decision, and I'm glad to see we're done with Lotaro experimenting. But I do think it's worth pointing out that we scored four goals yesterday, and two of them were absolute gifts. You have Kalulu melting down and... (laughs) <laughs> I, I I honestly can't explain to you what he was doing when he kicked <laughs> this full power kick into Dumfries' ass. That was fucking probably the highlight of the season so far for me. Um, yeah, and it goes to show like our four goals, two of them were gifts, as you said. Juve's four goals were all for were all from open play, and that just speaks to all well, the attacking kind of proficiency of both sides, right? Conseil, whose name both of you butchered, uh, he was terrorizing that left flank all night long, making an absolute fall of Demarco. We really missed Carlos Augusto this game, but um, 
in any instance. Conceição was a menace. Yield is obviously the man of the match. In my opinion, Conceição a close second. And it's problematic that we can't stop these dribblers. There's just a lack of speed in the team in general. And so we accept the risk of getting exposed from time to time when we play the way we do, which is so advanced. We play high up the pitch with both center backs bombing forward. And there, there really isn't like a one size fits all solution here. We either need to just play deeper and play on the counter, or we need to not get caught on the counter. But again, that's kind of impossible when you play the way you do. It's kind of like not making mistakes at the back when you try and build from deep, like it's inevitable. All teams do it, even Barcelona do it from time to time. So mistakes happen, but yeah, finding a way to mitigate these with the best balance possible is literally uh, Limona's job here. It's what he's paid to do. As a tactician, it's his job to be a problem solver, and this is a big problem that we need to solve. Speaking of problems, I almost don't want to talk about it because it's at this point it's just it's it feels repetitive. But what the fuck was Defry doing on some of those goals like that? Like that first goal, I don't know where he was. That was an excellent ball from, of course, Juan Cabal picking out McKenny, who laid it off for Vlahovic. But where the fuck was Defry? He was like on the left side of the pitch for some reason. And then on the second goal, again, instead of blocking the channel for the path, he went to try and mark. I think it was Vlahovic, who was um, who was right, who, who was being kind of shielded by Bastoni anyway and then just left the man completely open. So, I mean, this guy is, is costing us. This guy's a problem. And the alternative to him is an injured 35 or 36-year-old. And so I think the defensive frailties that we're seeing are not exactly coincidental either. You know, And it was always a risk going into the season with without a big investment in that central centre-back position, which is one that we were pining for for the most part of preseason but it is what it is I guess um, we simply have to play it on the fly play it a bit fast and loose and just hope that we can recover the form of other areas of the team so that our our, er- our areas of weakness are are a bit more um, shielded and that we get less exposed uh, through the middle of the pitch but yeah I, I am concerned about that position in, in particular. And um, on Bissek, I just want to say that I still like the kid. I still think he's got great potential, but this season has not been good. You know, last season, he took some great strides and it looked like we've got a real prospect here. But this season, he seems to be, um, it's like he's starting from zero again. He just seems like a shaky, unproven kid whose talent we're not quite sure on. And that's such a shame considering... You know, the like I said, the big leaps he made last season where a lot of us were saying, hey, this guy's, you know, got real, got real potential here. Yeah, D- DeVry was easily one of the two or three worst players for us yesterday. The The man marking on the first goal was inex- inexcusable. I mean, he, he wasn't doing anything. He was just watching as McKin- McKinney ran by him. And it it really speaks to the need that this team has for a new central center back. We've talked about this ad nauseum, so I won't harp on it, but you, you know it's coming. You know, this will be the last season of the DeVry a chair be arrangements. Irfan, who if we want to talk a bit more positively, like who was your man of the match from an inter perspective? I think it's gotta be Taram. I mean, you know, when we think about Lotaro and how frustrated we are with some of his play um, this season. I think the opposite can be said about Taram. I mean, the guy is everywhere. I mean, he he set up Mkhitaryan for his assist. Uh, he uh, for his goal, Mkhitaryan's goal. He got an assist on that goal. He set up. Um, you know, he got the first penalty uh, as well. Uh, and he's just he's just very lively. I mean, you could still say his kind of final decision sometimes is not the right one. Uh, but he's everywhere. I mean, he's active, you know, to the extent we have a player who can kind of retain the ball in tough areas and maybe dribble or take on a defender. He's the closest thing we have to it. And he's active. He's busy. He's relatively fast. 
um, as far as our team goes, he's fast. And, um, you know, he's, he's, he's busy and he's inventive in the box. Like he's laying the ball off. He's trying to get other players in. He's holding the ball so the midfield can crash in. I mean, he's just doing a lot of stuff. Uh, in addition to scoring goals, he he didn't really get a goal yesterday. Um, it's been a couple of matches now since he's had one, but he's been active. He's been lively. He's given us a spark in attack. Um, he's also a problem for for defenders. Like individually, I feel like he's very difficult to defend because he's pretty physical, and so I think it makes the job of the opposing center backs very difficult. And his movement actually this season has gotten a lot better. He finds himself in positions where he can kind of draw a defender out of position or sit right in between two defenders. So I think, I think Taram's been, been good. He's been kind of the bright spot for us. And I think yesterday he, he showed the same thing. He was fairly influential. Um, I think Zelensky took his penalties pretty well, but all in all, honestly, I think part of the reason our defense is struggling so much is because I actually think our Midfield also has just not been doing a good enough job, whether it's for Tezzi or it's Mikatarian or, you know, Zelensky. I'll leave off the hook because he just hasn't played enough. But whether it's Zelensky or um, Barella, like, I, I feel like there's something lacking in the midfield when it comes to the defensive covering side. Um, and yesterday, obviously, we really missed a con. Um, and I'll also just, you know, Throw in Aslani when he has played. He hasn't done a good enough job as well. But I think, you know, the midfield to me yesterday was a bit of a disappointment. We could talk about DeVry and DeMarco um, and Bissek and their kind of individual defensive problems. But I really do think it's a it's a systemic problem. It's the way the midfield is covering the defense. It's the way the wings are preventing those dangerous balls from coming in. It's the cohesiveness of the defense that I think is the biggest problem. Um, but again, kind of getting back to the negative, unfortunately. But yeah, to your question, I think Taram was pretty impressive. Uh, I think Pavard, from a defensive standpoint, was pretty pr- uh, impressive. But outside of that, honestly, I think everyone was fairly poor. The midfield looked so, so much better when Zelensky was playing as the deep-lying playmaker and Barella was in his natural position. Like it was just a world of difference. And then when we made the sub to take Zelensky off, and I can only assume that sub is because Zelensky doesn't have 90 minutes in him because otherwise yeah. it was a horrible decision. But when we made the sub to put Barella back to Regista and put for Tazy on, I saw a stat for Tazy completed two passes while on the pitch for 30 or so minutes. We, we lost the midfield and, so yeah, I don't know if Zelensky is my man of the match necessarily, but it, man, what a difference it made when him and Pavar came off. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I I really do think we're asking way, way, way too much of Barella. I mean, he he's he's consistently been probably our best player, and he's been playing really well this season too, and he's been doing everything we've asked for him to do. But you know, at some point, you can't just keep plugging him in in positions that he's not supposed to be playing. And it's not even that he doesn't do a good enough job as Regista. Like he, it's not his position. So obviously he's not as adept at it as Hakan is. So it's not even that he's not playing well enough when you put him in those positions. It's that we give up so much by not having him in his natural position. Like he, he's such a clutch player for us to keep our shape and to keep our ability to keep the defense on the other side under some sort of duress that I just think that anytime he's not playing his natural position, we're leaving a lot, um, you know, out of our tactics. And I think for Tezzi, it's just, ah, man, I, he's such a conflicting player for me because I love midfielders who can score. And I love midfielders who find themselves in positions where they can score or where they can, disrupt the back line enough that someone else can sneak in or, you know, the back line loses its shape. Like I love players like that, but he's just so, he's just so one dimensional. It's unbelievable. And again, I'm not picking him, picking on him yesterday. Cause I don't think he was nearly on, you know, the top five or six of the blame list, but it just goes to show you that some of the players that we do have 
that we can bring on while they're effective, they're still too one dimensional. And I think the other thing we just, we can't get past is that I think Mata has us figured out. Like I honestly think he has tactically Inzaghi beat down. Like it's, it's, it's unbelievable to me because again, going back to the Bologna match, I feel like we lost, we drew this match the same way we lost that match. It's, it's just one of those things where I, I, I think Inzaghi just needs to get a little bit more creative in game because I think Mata and some of these other managers are kind of figuring him out. Like you have a team full of veterans, they get tired. They probably know exactly the substitutions that Inzaghi is going to make and can plan for that. And there's just nothing kind of that Inzaghi is doing that can kind of counter some of the ways that managers have him figured out. And I think that's been one of the big differences this year too, that I think he's just becoming so predictable that managers are able to kind of game plan around the inevitability of what this team is going to look like after the 56th, 60th minute. The constant defensive insecurity in my mind is, as with all things, it's a combination of factors, but I think the biggest factor is, is mental. I don't think it's systemic or rather, I don't think that's the main issue. I really do believe it's a matter of complacency. And I think complacency begets complacency. This relaxed and just taken for granted attitude is overconfidence, just being too assured in in assuming that we would win. I think that seeps into the squad or has seeped into the squad. And that's why you see so many late goals being given up by this team. That's why you see the play is not really fighting kind of tooth and nail to to hold on to these leads. And that's why we're just hemorrhaging points left, right, and center. That's why we're conceding these late goals after the 75th minute pretty much on a weekly basis now. So that's, in my opinion, Inzaghi's single biggest hurdle to overcome this season. How do you snap this team out of... How, how do you kind of take the positives, the swagger from the confidence from being champions and being deserved champions last season. How do you take the good things from that and eliminate the the negative aspects of it, the overconfidence, the arrogance, the complacency, and kind of reinstall, reinstill that that hunger in the guys, that humbleness, that that yearning to to win. Again, we finished the league twenty points ahead of second place last season. Instead of building on that, we're just letting the upper we're just letting the opponents catch up. And like I said, some of that comes from the external factors of the finances and the management. And some of it comes from the players just thinking like, just playing like they're, they're destined to win. They're not. You know, we've dropped points, not just against our two biggest rivals. We have one point from Milan and Juve, both games conceding late goals to throw away valuable points. But we've also done the same against, I think, the 18th and 19th ranked teams in the fucking league. When you have patterns like this, I really do think it's like a, a wider, not just um, tactical issue, but really like a, a mentality issue that needs to be purged from the squad somehow. Yeah, and, and, and I think the thing that's so frustrating is that after the Milan match in particular, like a result like this should never happen. I mean... <clears throat> if you did have some sort of false confidence, if you did have some sort of complacency after that Milan result where it was frankly embarrassing that you gave up such a late goal and you lost to an arch rival, you you should figure your shit out. I mean, it, the if whether you're an individual player who thinks maybe you're playing better than you are, whether you're just being a little lackadaisical or casual on the pitch, or whether you're the manager to instruct these players and to to rile them up to fire them up you got to figure that stuff out i mean that's why i'm saying it's it, it keeps happening over and over again i mean we're not really going to spend a lot of time talking about the midweek match against young boys but that that was also a pretty shitty performance all things considered now there you have the excuse that we were rotating pretty heavily but again it's the team's just not playing good enough so if they're trying to rest on some sort of laurels of last year i mean they need to be woken up at this point i mean we've seen enough results where you shouldn't have this sense of arrogance around you anymore um, because you're literally going to lose the season i mean we're sitting here we're still in second place which is great 
We're four points out, out uh, away from Napoli. We play Napoli in, I think, the third league match coming up, right? So I think we have two in between, and then we play Arsenal, and then we play um, Napoli. Uh, if 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 we don't win against Napoli, I mean, the season's kind of baked, you know? Like, yes, we'll lose some points against teams that we shouldn't lose points against, and Napoli might as well. But really, if you can't beat Napoli in essentially a six-point match, um, you're in you're in a world of trouble. Um, it's going to be hard for you to catch back up, especially given their fix, fixture schedule. So, again, like it's not it's not too early to start panicking um, and thinking that this team is good enough and is okay to be in second place. I think is is also you know, folly because this team is still designed to win another Scudetto. I think the expectation from all Inter fans is that we should win another one. Um, And if we're already kind of out of the running so early on, that's definitely a problem. So I think the team needs to be woken up. If, if individual players don't have the professional pride to be woken up after this, I mean, frankly, after the Milan match, they should have done so, but if they still don't have the professional pride, then, then, you know, you got to start cracking some skulls in the locker room. I, I just don't get it. The, this is not, you know, the complacency should have ended by now. Um, and you can't show that against, you know, your arch rivals in the Derby d'Italia at home. Um, and so if they're still not woken up after this, I mean, God help them. I don't know what else they need to be jarred into, you know, being a little bit more responsible on the pitch and putting forth a little bit more effort. I just don't know what else you're looking for. Um, this should be an eye eye-opening experience i mean just like some of the other matches were i'm trying to put on my best miko hat and think about well, what could you possibly be optimistic about for this game what, what, what are the what are the great takeaways and i'm, I'm coming up empty-handed there's just nothing positive i can even throw out there so Zielinski, to to i think Zielinski showed himself as a capable replacement for hakan and i, I gotta say i hate to say it Irfan, but <laughs> based on that one game alone, I'm taking him as a Hakan backup over Aslani. Also showed that he's obviously capable of scoring penalties. He scored two elite penalties against top opposition in a high-pressure environment. So that already puts him above Lautaro, in my opinion. Uh, so Zielinski showed his medal. He showed why he's the champion with Napoli. I almost said Natalie. And he showed that he can still be the player that he was on the Spalletti when they won the Scudetto and, you know, the, the great player he was in Serie A for many years before that. So that was one big positive takeaway. And just to give, or just to let Inzaghi off the hook a tiny bit, I will say that Zielinski himself did say that he asked to come off because he felt the flexor uh, tightening and didn't want to st- uh, risk it any further. So the, Z- the Z- Zielinski substitute was, yeah, uh, just uh, unfortunate. And not something we can blame Inzaghi for, as much well, as I would love to. Yeah. Well, look, I will say um, maybe this is the delusional fan in me, but I don't think we would have conceded four goals if Aslani was playing yesterday. So as good as Zelinski was, you know, clearly there were some defensive issues overall with the team. That I'm sorry, I don't see those sorts of defensive issues when Aslani is uh, slowly all right, all right. marauding the cool. midfield. <laughs> I, 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 don't see I agree. It. I agree. I'm we would have conceded you. five. No, <laughs> I, I, maybe we don't score four goals, but I don't think we concede four goals. I mean, I don't think there's anything in Zaghi's history that has uh, suggested, um, in Aslani's history, that has suggested that we would have conceded four goals. Right. If he was I, think, I, I think that's the. I think that's the most goals we ever conceded on Den Zaghi. It is. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I was talking someone on the forum, and I were going back and forth. This is the most amount of goals we've conceded in a match since Spalletti in 2018 and like the last game of the season against Napoli. Napoli 4-1. Zielinski scored a scream in that game, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, he did. Yeah. One kind of random tangent. I got to say, I appreciate that whenever we lose, and it's funny that we're talking about losses because we didn't lose, but if this game (laughs) feels like a loss, but whenever we do lose, we we keep it respectable, you know, the scoreline. We don't lose like... Five nil or four nil, <laughs> like, like fucking. Even Real Madrid got destroyed four nil against Barcelona. We all, you know, yeah, I think we'll the most, dumped. yeah, the heaviest we've lost in a long time since then is um, yeah, like two nil against Bayern Munich, three one. I think we lost three one at some point. Wasn't yeah, that a lot deal? Potentially, 
So that's one tiny silver lining to take. Um, but yeah, look, let's just hope that the team kind of takes this wake up call. You know, Inzaghi himself said that cannot happen. And he went on a bit of a, I don't want to say a rant, but he kind of let some frustration out. So it's clear that it's getting to the team a little bit. You know, first step of fixing a problem is accepting that you have one. So Man, let's go from is- there. This is just such a negative podcast. Like, I just I can't believe we're sitting here complaining about a four goal offensive explosion that we a had, where match. our where our star striker didn't even need to score. We didn't even need him to score a goal because the rest of the team pitched in, and we scored four goals against a team that had given up how many goals? How many goals had Juventus given up before they came in uh, against us? Maybe one, two. We, we so, haven't needed we haven't needed a score in 2024. Yeah, there you go. We just this is an offensive juggernaut of a team, and then none of us are even talking about that. I guess like that's, I, that's I know you're being sarcastic or fun, but I I would feel similar. <laughs> I I would not be opposed to that viewpoint if two of them weren't just absolute gift penalties. Yeah, like Kalulu just kicking dumb freeze in the back <laughs> is not like we won a penalty. That was a mental breakdown. If we scored four goals from open play, you might be able to get me there. Yeah, look again. One point against Juventus is never bad. But, yeah, I think everyone, all fans, regardless of how we cope with it, I think we expect better from the team. And I don't think it's unreasonable for us to expect better from the team. Um, because I know I think I think we're capable of it. I, I honestly don't see, despite how negative we are at times, right, based on analyzing individual results, I don't feel like the team lacks the talent or the management capability ultimately, of being able to win another Scudetto. And I don't think we're out of the race yet, but I do think that the team needs to start waking up a little bit and just just playing a little bit more, just more, I need to see more sharpness. I just don't see the the discipline and the sharpness on the pitch that I think is required. It should be the absolute minimum, and I just don't see it yet. Um, so again, it's still early in the season, no need to panic. But I do think, honestly, I do think that the game against Napoli in you know three match days is probably going to be one of the most important matches of the entire season. I do think a lot of our issues stem back to just a lack of competition. Like Mkhitaryan, I understand he scored his like vintage 2011 goal yesterday, mm-hmm. but he was poor. He turned over a ball in the midfield that directly led to a Juve goal. And that, it was just La t- that was Latara for the second goal. Are you positive? Anyway. No, I thought it was Mkhitaryan too. I thought it was Latoro. Like, Latoro gave away the ball at midfield, and then they went on the counter, which ended up in Conceição beating Mkhitaryan on the left on the right flank, and then crossing Maybe it in. Yeah. Maybe that was it. He just kind of tooled. He got tooled. He got anyway. tooled, but it was Latoro who the ball up, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, sorry. I will take your word for it. But my point being that we just don't have enough competition in the squad where it's somebody's underperforming, bench them, Agreed. put in this other guy. We just don't have that. We don't have youth and, either. Again, I know, I know we've talked about this, but like, why? Yeah, sure. The obvious answer is Juve have the Juve Next Gen or whatever they call it, the under twenty three side that plays in Serie C, but it's it's still not good enough. We we don't have a single young player to fill the squad gaps. I mean, we brought in Beden Beden Brook or whatever that whatever that prick's name is um, <laughs> to play against young boys. Obviously, he didn't play, but. We just don't have any of these guys. And meanwhile, Mott is throwing on the likes of Savona and Bangola. And Yildiz is 19 years old. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yildiz is like, like I can concede that Yildiz is probably the exception. But what I'm saying is these guys, these younger guys, they give a good return on value. We we don't ever take that approach. We just go for the, you know, we'll, play, we'll pay a premium for guaranteed reliability that approach is, you know, we've spoken about this many times, but that approach is also, it hurts us in the long run, especially given our financial situation, given our need to operate on a shoestring budget. If anything, we really should be looking to our academy to try and promote talents instead where we're not even trying to do it. Well, it seems like you're advocating for some Palacios minutes coming up. We I, might thought see some... say, I thought you were going to say Asloni. <laughs> no, no, no. Who is Palacios? I'm not familiar <laughs> Some Palacios minutes down the stretch as a spark coming oh, off the bench. Are you talking about the seven million paperweight we signed? 
<laughs> we'll see how many minutes he plays. But maybe some plot. Oh, and don't forget, Buchanan's coming back. Talk about a spark off the bench. The guy's 25 <laughs> years old. <laughs> Talk about a young a young gentleman providing some spark off the bench. We got Buchanan back. From the main back. streets of Brampton. <laughs> yeah. Brampton, Ontario. <laughs> exactly. So that Can we I, have that to look forward to. Do you guys? Would you guys give Martinez a start against Empoli? <laughs> what, following... No. I don't know. Any, I don't know anything about Martinez. I don't. I don't even know how to evaluate that request, Jay. I don't, don't, know. don't even know what he looks like. Couldn't pick him no up. Play slide up. We, we've right. done. We've done him wrong this season. We we should be, have used him in softer spots earlier in the season. Like when you are, I don't even want to say. Maybe let, I was going to say young boys. Let's say forget young boys because that was a summer homecoming Switzerland game, but Red Star is like the perfect landing spot where you should have been putting this guy out there, seeing how it goes at relatively low risk spots. And now it's too far gone where the fixtures are too critical. And you know, and Zoggy doesn't trust this guy as much as summer. And now you're looking at this guy will debut in the Copa Italia and he's going to get the Aldero treatments. It's just, it's too far gone at this point. Yeah. Or if summer gets injured and then we get the Radu treatment from him, right? Like, I mean, I agree with you. I think if you have a player like this, you should be sprinkling him in here and there because the last thing you want is, you know, if Summer picks up a knock and then you have to rely on him against a good team in the Champions League or against like Napoli or something, like what the hell are you going to do? Like the guy has not played anything. Uh, And I know you don't sub in keepers and shit like that, but giving them a start, you know, if you've paid this much money for him should not be something so you know unforeseeable like you should be able to figure out a way to get him in a match at some point and not have to rely on injuries or some you know bs game especially yeah, when the guy's 25 from here yeah <laughs> he came from the league it's not like there's a language barrier it's not like he unfamiliar with the environments like he was at general last season yeah and mm-hmm. other teams are playing their second goalkeepers out of necessity plenty of times yeah and like you said jay i mean we're we're we have to rate him against this version of Summer as well. Um, so it's not like we're comparing him to some crazy world-class keeper that consistently gives us a chance in a match, right? I mean, Summer, I, I, I don't think he's been poor, but I don't think he's been exceptional enough where he's untouchable. And it goes back to the same point you, you guys were making earlier about the squad kind of competition. Summer knows rain or shine good performance or bad he's going to go out there and be the starter and sometimes benching a player for one match in a calculated match might actually give them a spark and make them a little bit better i mean you know the last thing i'm sure summer wants to hear is that hey if you don't improve you might be we might be phasing you out for this guy and so that might you know light a fire under his ass and you might see a bit of better performance and the same could be said for someone like mkhitaryan i mean you can't just you can't just Accept the fact that some players always going to play, you know, especially if the results have not consistently shown that that should be the case. And so Mkhitaryan being the first name on the on the team sheet, it's just that should not be the given. That's not the sign of a of a healthy, hungry team. Yeah, just for comparison, Juve have already benched and rested Di Gregorio three times this season, twice in Serie A once in the Champions League. So it's not like this is an unreasonable request. This is what top teams do. And once again, we spent 20 million this summer and are going to get 15 minutes of action out of these two players. Well, so, go ahead, Jay. Do you, do you, uh, so, uh, Martinez against Empoli? <laughs> <laughs> Buy or sell? Buy, fine. Something needs to change. I don't appreciate you making a mockery of our buy or sell game lately, but I, I will go ahead and buy it. Two buys. Yeah. You buying two? It is now there's an argument Venezia is the softer landing spots. Like at home, I think we play Venezia on the weekends. So like that might be an easier game than Empoli. Agreed. Let, let, let's do that. I'll buy. I'll, I'll buy a Martinez start against Venezia, and I'll be wearing my. Venezia jersey from the last time they went Serio. <laughs> All Fair right. Enough. I we're gonna skip recapping young boys because that was just 
a horrible performance, but honestly, we were playing all substitutes. Substitutes. Arnautovic is a corpse, and that's really all there is to say about that game. But let's let's peek ahead to Empoli. Empoli is one of those teams who I think we talked about last season. There's always that team in the league who's higher up the table than you'd expect and you just know a collapse is coming. And for me, Empoli is that team this year where sure they have they've only lost two matches on the season. They've they've been a bit of a draw merchant, but when you look at like the underlying numbers, this team blows and I'm fully expecting a regression. Now I'm sure that regression will come after the play enter. But yeah, if you look this Empoli team a lot of low-scoring games. They drew Juve 0-0. They drew Fiorentina 0-0. They hung on and lost to Napoli 1-0. But like they've had some absurd luck in games. If you look there, they, they beat Kyrie 2-0 earlier this year, despite being outscored on XG 3-0 by Kyrie. Like there, there's a collapse coming here. I don't think their form sustainable. And this is a team that doesn't score goals, much like Monza. I think they've scored. They have like. They, they have like six leagues goals this year or something absurdly low like that. Their highest scoring player is actually former Inter senior team player Esposito. So th- th- this is a game you, of course, expect to win. The fear is just, are you going to be hung over? Are you going to be licking your wounds after blowing such a game against Juve on the weekend? So Irfan, we already talked about lineup decisions a little bit at keeper. Anything else in the squad you'd mix up this week? Um, no, not really. Not after this performance. I think the players need to play. Um, I'd give Zelensky another run out as long as he's feeling healthy. Uh, and then I don't know what a Cherby status is, but man, we need him back because uh, how bad devry has been. So I wouldn't change much. I think we'll see Darmian starting probably instead of Dumfries. I think he should roll out Taram and Lataro again. I just checked, and Empoli actually, like you mentioned, they've only scored seven goals, which is the third worst, or tied for second worst, basically. But they've only conceded six goals, which is actually the second best defense in the league, uh, tied after Napoli and Juventus. So uh, Empoli is going to be a tough nut to crack, apparently. Um, We'll see what we can muster. But um, the fact that they've scored seven goals means we're definitely not keep, keeping a clean sheet because I'm sure they'll score against us. Um, so hopefully we can uh, get a 2-1 win or something like that. But I, I, I suspect we'll see a very full-strength set, full squad. I, I, I think we should. The time to rotate would be against Venezia if you can get a good result here uh, because then you have, um, I think, Arsenal in that ne- next midweek. So I think um, I would expect to see a very strong lineup here against Empoli. Can I just say Rotega has ten goals in nine games? Why are you triggering? Why are you triggering? It? Triggering Andrew? I had a bad enough weekend. Is this really necessary? <laughs> For some reason, the thought of playing Empoli away kind of troubles you, doesn't not? But then if you actually look back at the, our record against them at Empoli, we've beat them six games in a row without conceding a single goal. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> in fact, we've played. 10 games, the last 10 games away at Empoli, stretching all the way back to 2006-7, we haven't conceded a single goal. So, you know, like it really should be a walk in the park. But if I remember the last time we played them, it took a DeMarco screamer from the outside of the box to, to beat them. So, I don't know. They're one of these teams, like I said, for whatever reason, it just feels like they're a more difficult opponent than they are. But as you guys have said, the numbers highlight some deficiencies and some weaknesses that are bound to be exposed soon and let's hope we're the ones to do it and i hope this you know on one hand i kind of wanted a bit more of a break between the the colossal derby disappointment and this match but at the same time i think having a having the opportunity to just pick up again or pick up and go again straight away might be beneficial for the guys as well you know just get the disappointment from the uva draw out of their minds move on to the next game and just try and get some momentum going because fucking Lord knows we need it. Yeah, it's just nice to get out there again. Assuming you can get the job done and win, cleanse the taste of that draw from our mouths. And this is a this is a tough run, and I'm really conflicted on how you approach this because you've got Empoli, like we said, Venezia is the easiest, like 
Valencia is one of the easiest matches on the schedule this year. But then you go back to back Arsenal and Napoli, like the, with a f- not fully fit squad. So really interested to see how we approach this. I think you have to start Taremi and give Lotaro a break at a minimum. I, I know we don't have a ton of other options in terms of available substitutions, but I would really like to see Pavar start over Bissac after yesterday's performance. So we can we can go ahead and do some predictions before Jay's hot betting tips. So Irfan, what do you got? Um, I'm going to predict a 2-1 win for Inter um, with goals from Barella and DeMarco. And Desposito. <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, that's a predicting, So you're predicting Empoli is going to break their yes. 18-year yeah. goal drought against Inter this weekend? Yeah, it just seems natural. Thursday. It just seems natural. I'll do you one better. No, I'm kidding. I think I think we'll win. Um, I think it's going to be a shit game. Like I said, I would love to see the guys use this opportunity to shake off some cobwebs. Use this as a uh, as like a tune up fight. You know, just just the opportunity to play themselves into some form and put on a show. But I don't know that Juve game. Just you know, whatever optimism I was feeling right after Dumfries scored that fourth goal just went out the fucking window. Given the way we ended that game, so. I think we'll win still, like I said, but I, I don't think we're going to see any like, you know, oh shit, we're back kind of thing. You know, we're not going to blow them out of the water or anything like that. So I'll, I'll take a 1-0 uh, and I'll give it to Turam because he's the only striker of ours who isn't a retard apparently. Andrew? Yeah, I'm expecting something Young Boys-esque in terms of just an ugly game that's yeah, yeah, borderline yeah. unwatchable that we somehow just through our champions dna grid out a win so give me also one nil and who do i want to sign the goal to G- give me a trammy goal we're due for a trammy league goal are you so, waiting for Jay's betting tips yeah <laughs> i want to ac milan napoli hot That's betting his... tip for tomorrow incidentally that was exactly the match i was going to predict <laughs> i'm going milan four napoli one Wow. <laughs> wow. Get out of here. Fonseca will... will show Conte what modern football is all about. I think I uh, think I'm rooting for a Milan win in this match to be honest. So No, 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 no. Um I'm I'm rooting hard for Napoli, but <laughs> I don't know. I think I think Milan have Napoli's number and they've had Napoli's number over the last few years, so I, I suspect they will and, they, and these things matter psychologically. That's part of what pisses me off so much about the Juventus match. You know, there are times when you have the opportunity to exercise these psychological demons and and you know try and kind of stack some weight on your side of the mental battle. And a four-two-five-two win over Juventus would have done that. But to then go and throw that away and let them let some fucking nineteen-year-old kid become the new the new sensation like that Juve. There's already 2 million views on YouTube and the highlights, I mean. And you know that 99% of those viewers are rabid Turkish fans going, you know, get and heal this. Definitely. You know, yeah, you know, uh, rooting for their kid. And it's the same shit we saw with Ansu Fati when we made him a hero at like 16 years of age against us in the Champions League back in 2019 kind of thing. But it's sad that we have to give these fucking twerps this, this platform to, to be a star instead of just, you know, making the story about us and our success. But, you know, that is what it is when you play like fucking losers. So in any instance, what I'm saying is that the psychology between two teams matters. And I think Milan have a strong psychological edge over Napoli. And so I'm predicting another big Milan win. All jokes aside about like Fonseca or Conte or any of that shit, I just think the players the players have been here longer than it, both of those coaches and the players will, will um, pull through for Milan. Unfortunately, that's my prediction. Well, we, we probably were... average about two million views, don't we? So that's right. I don't think that's that. That's about right. Yeah, I think it's a little bit higher lately, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. There we received go. a feedback point midweek of, <laughs> "Wow, if you guys listen to this podcast, it would sound like you're a bunch of Milan fans talking about Inter," and I can't figure out why. <laughs> I know, right? Especially after this betting tip. Where did that come from? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the this is the quintessential Inter podcast. Also, I, no, there's no chance. I will keel over and die if 
<laughs> Conte allows more than two goals conceded against Milan. Prepare to. <laughs> Prepare. This is my last episode uh, hosting interjections. Miko will yeah. be hosting next week. You know, prepare for prepare to uh, you know get get your get, get your samurai sword out. Prepare to commit seppuku because because shit's gonna hit the fan. Uh, on that lovely note, we will mm. go ahead and wrap up. We'll be back next week to hopefully recap an Empoli win and a Napoli win, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Catch you all then. Forza Inter in the words Forza, of Miko. Forza Inter. Forza Inter. Forza Inter. Yeah. <laughs> extremely low, extremely low yeah. Finnish <laughs> accent, which sounds suspiciously Russian. Forza Inter. <laughs> Have fun at the clubs, Miko. Have fun at the clubs. Mm-hmm.